John, um, just to give you a brief uh, background history uh, to him, um, read uh, natural environmental science at the University of Sheffield. And he was a founder member of Sheffield, I mean the, the, the city, not the university, of Sheffield Conservation Society. Subsequently, off to university, he worked in uh, water, oil and gas industries and is currently working in, and I hope I get this right, geographical information systems for modeling risk. And this is for Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, he moved to Sidmouth um, eight years ago and immediately joined the Sid Vale Association, I'm uh, pleased to hear. Uh, he uh, has been a great help at the NAP, uh, which is part of the um, uh, uh, Sid Vale Association, and he is uh, chairman of uh, Sidmouth Arboretum. Uh, in addition, uh, as part of the uh, uh, walks that we have from the museum, he and Ed Dolphin share, they take it in turns to do um, a walk uh, to look at um, uh, different tree roots around Sidmouth. Can I just ask before we begin, please, to make sure that everybody is muted and um, uh, uh, at the end of the talk, there will be time for questions uh, to John, and I'll say something else about future talks uh, and about the Sidvale Association. But now I'd like to uh, uh, warmly welcome John, and I understand that I'm not we're not allowed to use the term rewilding. Is that correct? It's uh, an expression we're not allowed to use this afternoon. <coughs> um, uh, over to you, John. Okay, fine. Um, thanks very much, Nigel, and thanks much, everybody, for coming along this afternoon. Um, yes, I uh, became or have become part of the uh, biodiversity group, which uh, started up in the middle of last year. <coughs> and um, it, it to me is a sort of progression from uh, the the arboretum side uh, of, of work that I've done, and. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, I will just warn you that uh, the, uh, the biodiversity group is still evolving its uh, its mode of operation. So you'll have to take this as my view of what's happening rather than necessarily um, the overall view. We had a long meeting last night about it and I don't think I'm that far out. So, um, this is a view of the, uh, the top of the valley. Um, and I'm not going to talk about uh, the sea, cliffs, or, uh, or the buys at all today. Um, I'm just going to concentrate on the habitats away from that. For those of you who have seen Roger's talk last uh, month, you will have seen lots of pictures of the, the cliffs and the sea. So I decided to steer away from that. This picture is taken on the on the bend as you come into the valley on the 358. I will have been around that hundreds of times, um, started coming to Sidmouth about 40 years ago. And it was always a, a view well, I like to see. Sometimes you can't see anything. Sometimes you get fantastic view of the sun setting over the sea. But <clears throat> it um, I took the opportunity in the uh, in the lockdown to actually bravely go across the road when there weren't that many cars and take this picture but it shows I think the valley in uh, all its sort of glory um, and it showcases the habitats that we have there you can see down to the river across to the uh, the moors with uh, the heathlands and all, all of the woodlands and fields which I guess we all have come to uh, like love and uh, it feels very much like home. So <clears throat> the talk's going to be uh, a little bit about the habitats that we find in the valley and the species that are there. And then I'm going to move on to, uh, to talk a little bit more about surveys and projects that have been undertaken already by the biodiversity group or are in progress as, as we speak. So 
if the biodiversity group is going to come up with uh, something successful, then I quite like that sort of definition. We're trying to encourage small actions by as many people as possible in the hope that it's going to make a big difference to the amount of biodiversity that we find in the valley. However, uh, I do have to warn you, that there's one slide in here which has a sort of a, a yellow P warning on it. Um, I started off by thinking, I can't really avoid talking a little bit about the pressures on biodiversity. Um, and then found, I thought, well, I can think of it as easy to one, two in that there's population and there's pollution. So I had two Ps, but you'll see on the slide that there's a lot more uh, pressure on biodiversity, but I'm not gonna discuss any of them. Each of the topics are really large. On the other hand, there's a green P triangle, which is trying to encourage everyone here and probably uh, I don't need to, to actually take some of their own actions to um, try and help biodiversity. And I'll give you some examples from there. So a couple of slides later on. So what are we, what are we talking about in, in the Valley? Well, we're, we're talking about a, um, a, a completely man-made habitat. Um, nothing that we have is, uh, is wild anymore, which comes back to Nigel's point that if we're trying to rewild, we're not actually, we would just be trying to re-establish species in different areas. And <clears throat> I've done a bit of uh, uh, research when I joined the group as to what were the target habitats and species that we would be maybe looking for. And the habitat list is, is reasonably easy because there's there aren't that many here and um they're fairly consistent so i'm going to do a whistle stop tour over river heaths hedges meadows and just a little bit on woods but not very much the other axes that you have to deal with in looking at biodiversity is really what species are we looking for and that's much more, much more difficult, um, or there is much more choice depending on how you look at it. And um, I've changed this several times, but I went to the ANOB uh, meeting last week or two weeks ago, I can't remember now, and they have an elusive eight, which are species that they're trying to encourage within the East Devon AONB. And <clears throat> Two of those, the brown hair streak and the Devon white bean, I will come back to in a little bit more detail. Uh, each one of them is a, is a story in itself, but the Heath Lobelia um, exists in one garden outside Axminster at the moment. And that house has been sold, but fortunately seems to have been sold to somebody who wants to keep the Heath Lobelia. So it may in turn be saved. And what we have to do is we have to look at a sort of matrix here of um, can we re-establish habitats that are suitable for any of these species and not all habitats can support all species so we have to come up with a balance which is looking at uh, how how to match those together and even when you get to that point are we going to have enough space uh, to bring all of these things back. The chances are not, so we need eventually to come up with a plan as to how that's going to happen. So <clears throat> the, um, the buzzword in, in biodiversity is really baselines. And this is uh, what I think we should be setting out to do. We should be carrying out surveys to look for various different species, see whether they exist here. And if they don't, are we trying to bring them back? So you have a baseline. <clears throat> a baseline can only, has to have more than one point on it. Otherwise we don't know whether we're gonna get better or worse in that uh, setup. And the SBA has done a really good job um, in 
13 and 14 with the, the survey on the River Sid, and we've got some really good baseline data there. We've also got baseline data from the, uh, the Arboretum survey that uh, Diana Reese set up with uh, iTree. So we know a little bit more about the woodland composition in the valley, <clears throat> and we would need to build that forward. The other aspect of baselines is really what do you what do you think are your baselines and i'm going to give you three examples of things that have really uh, impacted on me and i probably didn't realize quite how much until i came to uh, to do this talk uh, my baselines were, were pretty much set by my my parents i think um, my dad was a headmaster he taught me how to pass exams and to like maps and to deal with numbers. Um, it was my mum, though, who really was the person who um, set my baselines. Uh, it's a picture of some elm trees. Um, elm trees are remarkably common through the valley. Um, we found plenty of in the hedge, plenty of them in the hedge survey. And in this section of the hedge in Bickwell Valley, there are 36 elms because I counted them, but they die off after they get to about four or five meters tall. These are slightly bigger um, because of the bug that gets in and kills them off. And one of my earliest memories is my mother standing on a what I then thought of as a hill in Essex. I now think of it as a bump in Essex um, and pointing at the hedges and saying, all of those are elm trees and they're not going to be here for very much longer and she was right we don't have any uh mature elms or very few in the valley some of them have escaped the knock so my my second um baseline is butterflies and as well as walking we we had to cycle as children we cycled miles and one day we were coming towards home and a peacock butterfly was hit by a car in, in front of us. I was probably about six years old, but I remember it vividly. And my mom said, oh, we can't leave it there. So we, we picked up half a peacock butterfly and took it home. And it was the first time that I became aware of the beautiful colors that there are, are in, in butterflies. And we pinned it out onto a, uh, a cork table mat as you used to do if you were a, a butterfly collector and so I had a, that very young introduction to butterflies but more importantly when I was about 10 or 11 I had uh, we were walking on on Dartmoor and we came up to a, a farmstead somewhere abandoned and it's the only time in my life that I can remember not being able to count the number of butterflies that there were around there. There were, there were literally hundreds of butterflies there. My mum said to me, that's what it used to be like. So her baseline goes back that extra generation where we had these places where wildlife could thrive more. And I've only had that experience once. I would love to have it happen again. And this is kind of a little family joke, which I had to include. Um, birds, again, it was down to my mum. We were, again, somewhere on the south of Dartmoor. I can't remember where. And she was off with binoculars in the bushes somewhere. And she came back very excited. And she said, I've just seen a bird. It's red, got a red head, yellow beak. It's a bunting. It's got green legs, blue eyes, purple head, etc." And um, we all laughed at her, not that we would do that very often, and we christened this the, the ethnic bunting. And whenever we found a bird that we didn't recognize from then onwards, you know, the family joke was it was an ethnic bunting. It didn't matter what it was. And um, it was only sort of later when I started to think about what that could have been. And I'm pretty sure it would have been one of very few at that time, Searle Buntings, of which this is a picture. And um, we are now starting to appreciate Searle Buntings in this area. And I will show you that uh, a bit later on in terms of what's happening to the, 
uh, help out with them. So my baselines were set, you know, a long time ago. And if you if you think about what your baselines are, you can perhaps put those into the chat and we can have a talk about those because I'm sure there will be other people who've had other experiences of numbers of uh, species that they've seen or things that have changed them. So I'm now going to do just a very quick uh, whistle stop tour of the habitat. So here we are on the River Sid, and the Sid is obviously uh, the, the catalyst that has created the environment that we live in. I will do my advert here. Uh, I don't know whether you can read that. That's Roger's book on the Sid River, uh, which gives you a very good uh, outline of how the Sid River has cut the valleys that we we see. And they're wonderfully named, all of the coons, the packs, harms, the sweet coons, etc. And the paths further up the valley, if you haven't had the chance to explore them and you can, they're well worth getting a look at because there's some beautiful views and places up there. So here's the SID and it supports uh, a, a, a sub woodland, uh, the alder and willow woodland, which is on the Devon um, species list. And we, we were talking about it last night at the biodiversity meeting and sort of trying to say, you know, where is this alder woodland? Anecdotally, I think we see more alder than we do willow in, in the valley, but we haven't really looked for that yet, but it is a target uh, environment within the, um, within the valley. So I'm going to show you just a few maps and when the biodiversity project uh, started, um, we thought that we would be having to collect the data um, in spreadsheets and map it in this uh, mapping system. This is a geographical information system that Nigel mentioned, but the um, I'll come back to it later, but we've now found a tool which we think is useful for collecting data ongoing. But the um, the SID uh, was surveyed by the SVA, and now uh, Jan has uh, been working with the West Country Rivers Trust to set up some survey points to see what the water quality is, and also to look for the fish and the invertebrates within these areas in the along the Sid Valley. And you know, we can then baseline that and see whether we are seeing improvements or degradation in water quality or not. The other thing which excites me about doing this work is that um, with my science festival hat on, and I have been involved with the junior schools in the science festival for about seven years now, it's an opportunity to get youngsters into the SID looking for and getting excited by the wildlife they find. And hopefully we can even extend that to looking at the water quality side. Very important to get youngsters involved in uh, appreciating their environment. So I'm now moving up to the top onto Fire Beacon. Um, this is uh, Fire Beacon Trig Point and um, we don't have a huge amount of heathland within, within the valley. And this is another example of where we're gonna to have to balance what we're trying to do. So the heathland supports some wonderful species, uh, green hair streak, Dartford warblers, uh, hobbies I've seen up there. And <clears throat> the, the town council and the RSPB are extending the heathland by removing the conifers in the background all the way along. And the plan is to create a, a link all the way along East Hill Strips. And that's fine. And it will give us more heathland habitat. But is it right? Is it the right balance? It's very difficult to actually know whether that's the case. So these are my butterfly surveys that I was doing. Uh, until a few years ago uh, on uh, Fire Beacon Hill. And that sort of is the corridor that possibly could be opened up to re-establish a heathland uh, habitat up there. 
uh, now moving on to the um, hedges. This is something that um, we decided to do uh, last spring and summer, uh, prompted by the Devon Wildlife Trust. Uh, they were looking at uh, ash dieback and <coughs> we knew we had ash dieback in the valley. So um, we set out to survey the hedgerows and look for uh, the number of standard trees that there were, were in the hedges, uh, the number of small trees which could potentially grow up out of those hedges if they weren't flailed uh, off, the, the shrubs that exist in the hedgerows and the flora that we were finding. And interestingly, the, the, the hedge status itself, was it being looked after? Had it grown out? What was the, uh, what was the flailing regime on there? Didn't realize then how relevant that would be to other, another project, the Brown Hair Street project, which I'll come back to. But if you haven't had a chance to read Ed's write up of, of the, uh, the information that we found, then I would urge you to have a quick look at it. It's really interesting what we found and the evolution of the hedges up and down the valley. And then we have uh, the last habitat that I'm going to mention is the uh, flower rich meadows. And that's not an extensive uh, mapping of them. It's just the ones that I've been involved with surveys for either butterflies or flowers or grasshoppers uh, on, on an, in and around the town. But there is a, a project coming up which uh, East Devon District Council are doing to promote life on the verge. And that will be trying to encourage people to uh, allow the verges to um, have a little bit more of a rougher feel to them, bring uh, plants back in, bring insects back in, and increase the biodiversity really from the bottom of the pyramid. So we're hopeful that that will be the case um it's been delayed somewhat shall we say the the challenge for creating flower rich meadows is that you have to actually establish them first of all but then you must look after them and that can be done in in one of two ways um, you can either have a, a mowing regime which is um possible to be done. So you, you mow at the end of the season, you must get off all of the grass so that you're beginning to impoverish the soil. But we've been very lucky to have within the town on the, on the nap itself, uh, sheep grazing every uh, autumn for the last five or six years. And we're beginning to see more and more wildflowers coming in on the nap as that process uh, goes on. This year, I think anecdotally, we've got more salandines and more primroses already uh, up on the, on the Nap hillside. And um, they are liked by nearly all of the neighbors around here. I keep getting asked when the sheep are coming back. So <clears throat> this is the dark cloud that, that is hanging over uh, biodiversity um, taken again up on Fire Beacon Hill when when there was snow on a glorious day and we were walking across there and suddenly this huge black cloud appeared over the uh, over the moors and came quite fast towards us I was pretty convinced we were going to get wet but um, it's it is a problem that we face in all the things that I've just said about trying to increase biodiversity, we're up against a lot of uh, my yellow pea warnings. And as I said, I started with two, and then just every time I came back to put another slide in here or change this or whatever, there's, there's a few more things, aren't there? And I can fill this gray cloud with all of the different things that are going on and uh, are affecting biodiversity in 
better for, for worse ways, I think. Um, and each one of those has a, um, a talk in it. You know, there, there's a lot of information out there. But I'm going to make one point, and we've, we're, we're just about running into COP26, uh, which is surprisingly 26 years since the first one in Berlin in 1995. And despite all of the talk and effort at those uh, conferences, uh, CO2 levels have gone up from 360 parts per million to 414. So that in itself is, is just a warning. And as I said at the beginning, I didn't feel I could just go through this uh, talk without saying there's a lot of pressures on, the, uh, on, on biodiversity across the world, not in the valley, of course. So we have to move from being um, pessimistic to being slightly more optimistic. So the grey cloud still exists, but um, from our point of view, i.e. the walking point of view, the cloud stopped and we remained in the sunshine, but you Poppleford got one hell of a soaking. Um, so you can't just uh, expect the cloud to go away, it will get you somewhere. So what can, um, what can we do about that? Well, we can start to think about this in um, maybe these four ways. So the, the green warning is really things that you as individuals can do and the biodiversity group will try and encourage you to do. Beyond that, I think we're working in partnerships with other organizations. In general, they're professional organizations and they're already starting to put things in place where if we have a group of volunteers, we can go out and collect data, establish baselines, decide how we're going to do things. Then there'll be projects and finally we'll end up with plans. So, what, what can you do? And I imagine that most of you will have thought about this, many of you will have already done it. So uh, it's really trying to encourage as many people to take a bit of responsibility for increasing biodiversity. This is a pond in our garden, it's not very big, and it has frogs in. And if you do a bit of phenology, another good word, you can uh, record, or at least Penny, who's sitting by me, recorded every year since the pond went in when the frogs produced their frog spawn. And you can see it's getting slightly earlier, which didn't do them very much good this year because on um, 10th of uh, February, Roger's talk, when it was so cold, the first batch of frog spawn was frozen solid in our pond. Um, that didn't deter them because a few days later there were seven more frogs back in there producing some more frog spawn. But it's not, um, that isn't always going to be the case. As, as the climate changes, species are not going to be able to adapt as quickly as they might be, you know, as we would like them or we need them to. <clears throat> so we've got that in our garden and Here's a picture of the uh, wildflower meadow again that Penny has created behind our house. The, um, we had two more fruit trees which we've taken down and a patch of grass. And now there are uh, about 60 species of, of wildflowers growing in the garden, including the ragged robin, which you can see there in profusion. Uh, it likes the wet soil, uh, which comes from the water coming down from the nap. At the same time as having a patch of wildflowers, which is going to increase the uh, uh, bug life in there. We see lots of bees and we see butterflies on them. Uh, we've also got enough trees, fruit trees, to take us through uh, our own apples, last us from about August until February uh, without freezing them 
so on. So anyone who can do a little bit for uh, producing their own food is going to have an impact on uh, improving the biodiversity by reducing the impact of food. And then the last, oh, sorry, that's, that's a list of the top eight uh, of the 60-odd uh, species that we have in, in our garden. And the last thing that I think as individuals we have uh, the ability to do is we have, we have the pound. If we believe that we want to improve biodiversity, then we have the ability to change the way that we purchase, buy things more locally, do things more locally. And um, I think that is going to be one of the big, you know, the big changes and we have to work out how we're going to do that. There's also a, a really big change coming up back to ELMS, which in this case stands for the environmental land management payments, which the government are going to change. And there will be big changes in the agricultural industry, which we don't really know how it's going to impact, but that, that will have, I hope, a positive effect on biodiversity. I'm going to move now from the, uh, the personal one back to the group. And um, here's a, another, another picture. You probably will all recognize where this in the middle of Sibri. Um, the reason for putting that one there is that I was taking this, this photo and there's a lady who lives in the cottage diagonally across from the, uh, the tree. And she came out just as I was um, taking the photo. And she said, that's a cork oak, you know. And my excuse is that's why I missed the top branches. Um, but it probably wasn't. I just missed them anyway. But it's actually quite difficult to answer the question, that's a cork oak, you know, if you do know that it's a cork oak. And I was trying to think of a... Um, a suitable reply that was anything other than yes, um, which I struggled with um, when she said, it's beautiful, isn't it? And it was said in a tone that I want to try and encourage us all to have, which is that we have to appreciate the beautiful things that we have around us. And I'm sure you all do, but but if we can get more people thinking like that, that the environment that we live in is precious and that we can do something for it, then that's a really good message to, uh, to take away. So in there, we're now going to talk a little bit about the surveys, a bit more, and the projects that uh, the biodiversity group has, has undertaken or is undertaking. I've already mentioned the, the Sid River and we're looking to build on that. Uh, the tree survey from the Arboretum and the hedge survey. But a really interesting thing came in to, um, to Ed on Facebook on um, the flora sidostiensis, which I still struggled to say and had to write down, um, which Melinda Keeble had found. It's a book in, it was in the library, which has 600 flowering plants and trees that were found in the valley in the 1840s and I'll come back to that in a minute but it, uh, our intention was that we could build it on the hedge survey but we've now got something which enables us to do a lot more than that. The brown hair streak uh, is a, a follow-on from the Devon, uh, Devon Wildlife Trust Saving Devon Treescapes project and uh, a lot of us have been involved in that, and I'll show you a bit more. And the latest project that the Devon Wildlife Trust have um, set going is on lichens. And the reason for that is that the, um, the lichens that used to live on elms uh, have moved themselves onto ash trees. Uh, apparently the bark of both of those trees is slightly alkaline and supports the uh, a set of lichens. There are 12 in the, in the uh, survey. And because we're losing the ash trees, we might lose all of these lichens. So we're trying to go out and find those. And, and finally, 
on the survey side of things, if there are national projects going on, uh, and Charles had been busy with that on the bird watch side of things, which has just happened, then if we can encourage people to look at the birds and record those or any other you know, butterflies, et cetera, et cetera. So the good thing about that is that all of those have come from um, quite all the professional organizations asking us about what we find. We don't actually need to make up that list. We can go out and do the things that the um, that these professional bodies would like us to do. So that leads us to projects that may evolve out of the uh, these surveys. Uh, and, keeping the catchment right, doing something in your own patch, life on the verge uh, in terms of increasing the biodiversity on our roadside verges, all important things. But as we move nearer and nearer into the town, it's actually more difficult to do this, but each, each of the, uh, the projects that are being undertaken in the more urban areas have the opportunity to do two things, I think, in terms of biodiversity. One is to tell people about something, and that's what we've been trying to do in the Connaught Garden. So what trees have evolved in these geological periods? Uh, in the Goyle, we may be able to showcase all of the plants that Veach brought into the country. So it's got these, these projects will have stories to tell, which hopefully will showcase biodiversity, but also be interesting and bring people to the town. <clears throat> the, the other thing that they need to do is just provide some um, rougher areas so that we can have um, bugs and insects and wildflowers uh, in amongst that. And it doesn't have to be a huge amount. It's not going to uh, um, you know, take away that beauty. It's just trying to have little patches which in, it, uh, take biodiversity into account. So this is a picture of uh, a, a software system which uh, was recommended to us again by Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, as a recording system for all, all things natural, actually. So um, rather than going out to 11 or 12 hedgerows and looking for uh, plants within those hedgerows and bringing them back and mapping them, you can now take a photograph and link it into iNaturalist. It will show, it, it knows the date that you took it, it knows where you took it if you enable GPS on the phone. And in that way, we can build up a picture of all of the plants that we see, uh, the flowers that we see around the valley. And by um, restricting the geographic area and using the um, attribute flowering, we can then see how many species we've got. And you can see this is going back to January now, and uh, Ed's just sent out something for the first set of readings for March. We had 78 flowering observations from five observers across the valley in January. A lot of those February, because I think they were remnants of last year's flowering plants. But it, do, it, it doesn't matter as a, as a principle, it's a way of easily bringing together uh, communities of people that doing that are interested in um, natural things. So um, Melinda with the library's uh, nature table and the U3A's nature group can both contribute through this piece of software to collecting the data. And the Lichens project now has a, a list of all lichens within the Sid Valley, but also the 12 lichens that are uh, part of the Devon Wildlife Project. The book up here is the uh, Flora Sidioensis that Melinda found with the species in there. So we can actually uh, use that as a, a really long way back baseline 
and see how much change there has been. It will be very interesting to see whether we get anywhere near the 600 species that they found uh, 170 years ago. Uh, that uh, will be fascinating. Going back to the elusive eight, the Heath lobelia, I thought, oh, great, it would be so good if the Heath lobelia had been found in the valley and was recorded in the book. But unfortunately, it isn't and uh, uh, isn't something that uh, um, we can uh, claim for the Sid Valley, unfortunately. So I just finally want to return to my baselines. And as I said earlier on, <coughs> this is um, something that we are seeing, I think, more and more. And I think this is this is so good from many ways. It, unfortunately, it's not in the valley. It's just across um, near Otterton in the fields of the farm there at Stantyway. But each field has a, a notice on it saying what they're doing and why. And hopefully you can read that. But it's actually being farmed with the hope that the soil bunting will return. The um, Birds are, are, I suppose, relatively easy to um, get back. They can fly in and will do if the habitat is right. Trees, possibly slightly easier, you would think, in that we can go and plant them. But um, the ANOB has a, a project which I have to read, which is making sure we get trees in the right place. And this is very true, not all trees will grow in, uh, in all areas. But <clears throat> I'm extremely pleased with that tree because that is a disease resistant elm. The council had to take down a lot of ash in Long Park uh, because of the ash dieback, uh, but we were offered this tree from the tree wardens. So it's the first disease resistant elm to be planted in the valley as far as I know um, and we did that in in January and hopefully it will be the start of recolonizing the valley with the, with the elm the lovely tree that it is. This is another um, project and you'll have to take my word for it you probably had to take my word for it that that was an elm as well but within those three tubes on the, on the nap are dead and white beans and that is one of the elusive eight species uh, that the um, ANOB are in, were encouraging us to to plant so we changed the arboretum program planting program this this winter to concentrate on on the uh, dead and white beans also there were only 30 of them so we could do it on singly but and get out and, and get them planted. So there are now nine locations uh, around the valley that have dead and white beans in and I think uh, Ed will correct me if I'm wrong we've only ever found one which is in the byes somewhere uh, up to now within the valley. <coughs> Excuse me. So trees we can we can deal with but I'm going to end with just a, a quick talk on a oh, little bit on the on the brown hair streak. Um, I came to the conclusion when I was sort of thinking about this that that butterflies are actually remarkably like people. Um, there's there's a few butterflies that go on long journeys every year. Um, they travel thousands of miles. They stop off every now and again, and then they fly on, um, thinking they're of the monarchs and painted ladies. We have other butterflies that um, do occasional trips like that, like the clouded yellows, and they sort of end up having a mass um, landing. Uh, I'm sort of equating that with something like uh, Glastonbury. And those are the, the clouded yellows. They're all, get, you know, they'll all come over from France every now and again beautiful butterflies, we don't see them that often. And then you've got um, butterflies that will eat anybody's cabbages uh, and the browns and the blues, which like short grass and some of them like long grass. And so you know, we've got these 
different sort of habitats which the butterflies fill those species. And um, this one, the brown hair streak, has a really peculiar um, life cycle. Um, it's very, very uh, pernickety, shall we say. Um, so it likes blackthorn, uh, which I've never really liked blackthorn, having done some hedging around here. It's great hedging material, but it's horrible to work with. But the brown hair streak breeds in the tops of ash trees. That's got a bit of a warning to it. And uh, then comes down and lays its eggs in ideally grown out blackthorn hedges. So in here you can see that the hedge is growing out and it's got new growth. It isn't um, absolutely a rule, but they seem to prefer that type of environment. So a group of us have been out and we've been looking for that little white dot, if you can see it. That's a uh, black, uh, sorry, a brown hair streak egg. Um, they are beautiful uh, when you see them in, in magnification, but they're only about two millimeters across. So you have to get there uh, in this time of year. By March, it's too late because they're starting to discolor and uh, the leaves are sorted out. So there was a window of opportunity to go and survey for brown hair streak eggs for uh, the Devon Wildlife Trust. And these are the results. And uh, the, um, you can see they were appealing for surveyors to cover the whole of Devon, which they've had some, you know, some success. But we did, we did manage to go out and cover the whole of the Sid Valley. Even that hole there, um, Penny and I have filled, um, but it hasn't caught up with the records yet. But the good news is, well, that uh, within East Devon, eight of these dots were unknown um, grid squares for the Brown Hair Street. So there are eight more areas that have been found, not, not by us, but by others further to the east. And over, over the, um, the whole of Devon, there are over 200 uh, grid squares which have uh, Devon hair, uh, Devon, Brown hair streaks eggs have been found. So, yeah, encourage. Uh, what do we do next? And I, I contacted the ANOB about that and asked whether there's ever been any reintroduction programs because I'm not sure whether the brown hair streaks would make it as far from Seton to any uh, established habitat. And, and to date, no one has actually tried. But we now know that we haven't got them and we know what type of habitat we could make to encourage the brown hair streak. So just to uh, conclude, uh, what, would, what would success be like for a biodiversity group? And I think it, I'm trying to summarize it in the, with these four points. So we'll be trying to get more people understanding and celebrating uh, biodiversity and the, the beauty that we, we have in, in the valley. The lady that came out at Sidbury to tell me how beautiful the cork oak was, prime example. Can we uh, engender that spirit further? There will be people who can do that. There will be then, we, we would then need more people taking positive steps to try and help biodiversity in there are on their own lot of land. And it doesn't matter how big or small that is. If we can all do just a little bit, then we've, we've got a chance of bringing back um, more species. And then the final bit is we need, we need volunteers who can help go out and do these surveys. And the hedge survey to me was not pain at all. It was a great excuse to go and walk all of the uh, footpaths around the whole of the valley and look for uh, the species that we're finding in those hedgerows. So if we can get more people coming in doing that 
actually using the um, the iNaturist tool to record what they see, then we can we can actually establish the baselines and decide how or if we can bring back any more species or increase the biodiversity. So keeping people involved, getting them going. We've got a group that are now looking at the whole sort of communication side of things. Uh, there's a website, there's um, an Instagram group. So you can find out what we're doing in that way and there will be more things happening in that. And then on top of all of that, once we've got that, we need to make plans. And whether those plans are done by the group or actually are plans within the framework of East Devon or Devon itself, don't know uh, yet. And it, but the, um, the route to trying to establish how we can do that will balance up this, uh, list of habitats and species and, and see what can actually happen. I guess success will not be herds of wildebeest visible from a Sidmouth hotel window, but um, you never know. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. And if you've got any questions, please uh, ask them.